Okay, I've named the sermon today, um, Cain's Potatoes. We're going to look at the story of Cain and Abel. Yeah, Cain's Potatoes. Talking about pleasing God today. What pleases God and what does not please God. But Cain and Abel, this is an old story. This is way back at the dawn of time, 6,000 years ago. Um, look at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. We're going to read here and then put a little bookmark in this passage because we're going to go from here and jump around different places, but come back to Genesis 4. Genesis 4 and verse 1 says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So Adam and Eve, we know the characters Adam and Eve, real people, the very first living people God created there in Genesis, start of Genesis. But we know the story of Adam and Eve. They were people who did what? They disobeyed God. God put them in this beautiful garden. They had one rule, and that was, do not eat the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. They weren't supposed to touch that one tree. And what did they do? They disobeyed. They wanted to. They desired to do that. They had desired to have their own way, their own will. So this is the lineage, I'm sorry, right from the beginning of mankind. Mankind's lineage is one of disobedience, of rebellion to Almighty God. So here's Adam and Eve, though. They God kicked them out of the garden, but now they're starting to have kids. And I'm sure Adam and Eve, like any good parent, any God-fearing, God-believing parent, says that, well, this next generation, we're going to raise them right, and they're going to glorify God. So here they have a their eldest son named Cain. In verse 2 it says, And she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So there's two boys here, one Cain and one Abel. It says, Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain is a gardener. A man with a green thumb, a man with a real, um, I don't know, aptitude to nurture and, and cultivate um, um, vegetables out of the ground, food right out of the ground. This is who he is. The parents, no doubt, Adam and Eve, want their kids to glorify God, want their kids to, um, you know, be pleasing to Almighty God. No doubt. And with this oldest son, um, Cain, I'm sure they think, okay, this, this kid, Cain, he's got some real skills in the garden. So this guy, let's see what he can do. God's really going to like him. But we know already that one thing we need to know about this passage, and I know we're starting kind of slower, but we need to lay some, some ground floor. In Genesis chapter 3, we learn something. We learn in Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall, we understand that once Adam and Eve have the knowledge of good and evil, that they understand what's right and what's wrong, and they understand that they're naked, right? They understand that they're naked, and that nakedness is wrong, that sin is wrong. And so they needed a covering. So what did God do in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21? It said, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. Way back in Genesis chapter 3, you see an expression of the gospel, teaching the gospel from way back then, from the very get-go. That's why I always say that the Bible is a wonderful thing. You should try reading it. God made coats of skin and started clothing them right there. So there's sin, a typology of sin, nakedness, and God covering them. You'll find that is... My friend, in a nutshell, the gospel. Mankind has sinned. We need something to cover our sin, to pay the penalty for our sin, a sacrifice, an atonement. That's the gospel. So Adam and Eve are already understanding this concept. And I dare to say, because we learned that in Hebrews, I learned that Cain and Abel are probably learning, are, are well aware of this concept as well. So that's the concept. They need something to atone for them, something to cover up sin. But... Verse 3 says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So these two men, these two boys, they're going to bring forward something and give it to God Almighty. They're going to say, God, here it is. We know you're up there, and here's what we're going to offer you, okay? And I, I want to just stop for a second. This sermon today is for those who want to seek God, for those who want to please God. For those who want to find God's will for their lives, for those who know that this life is just fleeting, uh, you're going to die one day, you're going to stand before God, you're going to answer to God, that's who the sermon's for. I'm sorry, the sermon is not for those who could care less about God. I'm sorry, in, in this world there is a large portion of people that just say, one, that they deny that their God is even up there, they think that somehow they randomly got here. Uh, this sermon is not for them. It's also not just for the person who, who thinks that, yeah, there's a God up there, but he doesn't really have anything to do with my life now. I'm going to live however I want, to do the best I can. And it's not really for that person either. This sermon for those who want to offer something to God, okay? I'll give Cain at least that credit. Cain and Abel, they both at least wanted to offer something to God. And as we'll see, one here 
offer the completely wrong thing and one offer the completely right thing. But um, nonetheless, they wanted to please God. I, today, wherever you are, if you're just interested in God, go ahead, just shut off the sermon right here and, um, and go live your life, your fleeting years, and have a good time with it. Um, pleasures of sin are fun, but, yet, but just for a season. It's the point of man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. You may have 70 years of fun, but then you'll stand before God, mighty God and say, yeah, I ignored you my whole life. And he'll say, I'm well aware. But in verse 3, we see the pr- Cain trying to bring forth an offering. It says, In the process of time it came forth that Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Cain worked in the garden. He worked hard, sweating. The sun's beating on his head. He's tilling the ground. He's watering the plants. He's weeding the plants. Gardening's no fun. I don't, even, I don't like gardening. It's hard work. So Cain brings forth this offering to the Lord out of the sweat of his brow, out of something that he created, he produced with his own two hands. He did it, and he brings it to the Lord. On the flip side, verse 4, And Abel he also brought of the first things of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Listen to this. So Abel's the other side. Abel took the easy way out. He's not toiling for a long time. It wasn't the process of the time. He didn't bring it forth out of the ground. Abel, all Abel did, he's a watcher of the sheep, right? So he just sits there watching the sheep. He went and got the nicest, biggest, fattest looking sheep he could find. When he got the sheep, he brought it in, butchered it, and said, here, here's my offering. It's a sheep. The fat, the fat of the flock here. That was it. That's all he did. He took something God had given, and he brought forth, and he gave it back to God. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. We're going to dive into exactly what this means because the Bible explains this concept perfectly. And if you don't understand the concept by now and whatever, you're up in years, it's your own fault for never looking to God and his word. Well, we'll explain it today for us. We'll explain it today. But I want to, I want to touch in on what Abel's doing here. Um, because one, uh, he took the easy way out, right? They were just sitting there. The fat sheep was just sitting there. A lot of people like to say, there has to be more to the gospel than just that. When Brett and I go around knocking on doors in this town, which we, we're doing faithfully, we're meeting some who will have ears to hear, we're meeting many who do not have ears to hear, even professing Christians will not give us the time of day. Uh, they'll treat us with disgust. I'm already a Christian, bye! Well, if you're already a Christian, then I think we should be glorying around the fact, that, okay, we're here are two men who are trying to share the, the gospel. But that's not the, that's the response we get, and I'll touch on that later as well. But the idea that there more there has to be more to it than that. When we're on that visitation, and we'll tell people, here's a simple gospel. Christ came, he died for your sins. That's what I want you to believe. Christ paid the penalty for your sins. Christians, from all kinds of religious backgrounds to just the people who never go to church, they, they like to think, oh, there's more to it than that, you know? It's not just that easy. You, know, you trust Christ, but then you you gotta you gotta keep at it. You gotta work at it a little bit. You, you gotta try hard, do the best you can do, do some good things. Those people are no better than Cain. Amen. They're working their way to heaven. And you want to know? So, Truth Baptist Church is the church out of love that tells people there's a Cain. There's a Cain philosophy. There's a Cain church. A Cain belief system. A Cain belief system is found in all kinds of places. You'll find it in the Catholic Church, working their way to heaven. Take Christ, but we got to work, work, work. Toil in the garden some. Jehovah Witnesses, take Christ, we got to work, work, work. Cain belief system. Um, uh, Catholic Jehovah Witness, Mormons, you name it, all these people are working their way to heaven. Yes. Work salvation is a terrible belief system. Yes. It's ruining the world today. It's found 6,000 years ago here in Cain, thinking they are going to work our way to heaven, and it's throughout the Bible, but somehow in the year 2017, today we're confused about it. Confused so much that good churches, Baptist churches, Bible churches, they're even so confused about this whole thing that they've stopped preaching against those who are teaching Cain's philosophy, who are teaching work salvation. We've gone into this mo- mode of, you know... Those, those churches, they're doing their way, and they got some good things they're teaching. And in this church over here, they got their way, and they got some good things they're teaching. No, they're teaching a lie. They're teaching a falsehood. They're, they're teaching that our works justify us. It's absolutely wrong. Every church should be proclaiming that it is absolutely wrong. I'll touch more on that as we go. 
But here it is. The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Verse 5 says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. God does not like Cain's offering. Cain gets mad about it. The word wroth means he gets mad about it. That God did not have respect into his offering. Well, why? God didn't like Cain's offering. Why? Let's talk about this for a second. And I'll tell you why. It's the same reason, that same reason why they didn't like Cain's is the same reason um, the world today is hell bound. The exact same reason happened 6,000 years ago. The reason why is because God has already provided instructions. He knows, we know how we're supposed to please God, not with our works, but with God has given us, the gift of salvation, Christ Jesus our Lord. There has to be a covering for sin, a blood sacrifice for sin. Romans 10, verse 3, we quoted this on the doorstep yesterday. Um, uh, our deacon Brett did this. Somebody said, Romans 10, 3 says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. This is the Cain philosophy in a nutshell. We do not, we're ignorant of God's righteousness, that God is in control of all, that God sends a sacrifice for sin, and instead we're going to try to establish our own righteousness. In doing so, we have not submitted ourselves to the righteousness of God Almighty, our Creator. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. I quote this verse on about every doorstep, at least I try to, because we ask people, why would you go to heaven when you die, and they do not know the answer. Last week, we talked to a Catholic, and I've mentioned this before, the Catholic said, we got to do good things. Yesterday, we talked to a Mormon, who the Mormon said, it's, it's faith in Christ. And then I paused for a while, waiting for it, waiting for it. And then he said, and then you, and then you, and then you, you know, got to do the best you can. And then you got to, you know, do what God says. Follow the Bible. Not salvation, my friend. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. This philosophy has ruined the world. That's why you have false professors. That's why you have hypocrites throughout the world who call themselves Christians, but they don't believe the gospel of Abel. They believe the gospel of Cain, that they're going to work their way to heaven. We are all an unclean thing. Our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. That's the state of mankind, fallen without redemptive power within our own hands. There's nothing we can build, nothing we can toil at in the garden, anywhere in life that's going to make us righteous. The world needs to understand this. You, my friend, need to understand this. God did not honor Cain's offering because Cain's offering brought honor and glory to himself. It didn't bring any honor and glory to God. That's right. When Cain showed up there, who knows, a pile of carrots, pile of potatoes, pile of broccoli, all these things that he had produced, they're all wood, hay, and stubble. The Bible talks about the New Testament. When we stand before God and we tell him all these things we've done, this, this, our pile of productivity, God will say they're all wood, hay, and stubble. Amen. They will say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. This is the gospel today. This is the gospel that it was 6,000 years ago. It has always been the gospel. To flesh this out, would you please turn to Mark chapter 7. Before we're done today, we'll have a good understanding of the story of Cain and Abel and what exactly God wants to teach us from it. So just bear with me, please. Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, we see the Pharisees interacting with Jesus and his disciples. The same spirit that was in Cain thousands and thousands of years ago is in the spirit of the Pharisees and is in the spirit of the world today, in churches today, in Christendom today. The same spirit of putting, well, let's read through it here. In chapter 7, you'll find the Pharisees are concerned that the disciples are not washing their hands. They've got this rule, their elders, their tradition says the disciples need to be washing their hands, but they're eating with unwashed hands. So in verse 6, Jesus answers this complaint. He answered and said to them, Well hath Isaiah, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things like things ye do. Traditions of men. This is Christendom today. You, uh, a prime example of traditions of men is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. They build all these traditions, whatever it be, uh, confessional, rosary, all the things they preach, say, and do again and again and again. Um, vain uh, repetitions, the Bible calls them. Traditions of men. And they, of, they have omitted the weightier matters, Christ, the true gospel, the true sacrifice for sin. 9 says, And he said to them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. But it's not just limited to it's not just limited to the Catholic Church traditions. It's not. You'll find in all these conservative homes in the valley, all these whatever, all these fine homes, we have traditions. Yeah, I'm going to raise my family right. You work hard and, uh, you know, and you live the dream. You get a big Chevy truck. You drive around. And, and that's your tradition. Your family tradition is hard work. Make some money, raise some kids. That's your tradition, and that's all there is to it. And you're gonna stand before God and say, "Yeah, I did what I could. I, you know, I worked hard. I got the truck, and I got the three kids, and I got the dog, and I uh, didn't do anybody too wrong." Those are your wood, hay, and stubble in today's godless world. These these simple little accomplishments that we think are worth something. Traditions of men. Ten. For Moses said, "Honor thy father and thy mother." And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother. It's just talking about some, some silly little rule that the Pharisees have made up. But 13, what they're doing with their silly little made-up rule, their, their, their code of the West, their, their rule for living, their creed they live by, in verse 13 he says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such, like things ye, uh, many such like things do ye. So how many traditions are you holding to? What do you really think is important in this world? Now, I know everybody does. Everyone who is worth their salt, they're, they're building these things in their life that they think are good. Well, I'm a pretty good husband. I'm a pretty good father. And, you know, I'm a pretty good uh, teacher, whatever my occupation. And that's what matters, just doing the best I can where I can. No, you are a modern-day Cain bringing your vegetable, vegetables before Almighty God. And God does not require your sweat for salvation. God requires His sacrifice, His Son. And when He had called all the people unto Him, He said to them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. So this is talking about, um, ad, you know, talking about washing your hands, a little tradition. Today, People love to preach all this kind of stuff about worry about what you put in your mouth. You know, watch your calorie count. You know, ne never smoke a cigarette. Um, uh, work work your butt off on the treadmill. Worry about your physical fitness. All these things we think, all oh, these are really making us good. This is the labor we have. We're, we're taking care of ourselves. This is important. There's nothing from without a man that entered him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those that defile him. The things that ruin life, ruin society, are sin. Everything else is secondary. Skip down, if you would, to um, verse, verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. That's why our offerings are no good. That's why Cain's offering was putrid, because it's riddled with sin. Mankind cannot get past its sin problem without Christ. So all these good things we're doing, they're mixed with a thousand bad things, but our world today is really concentrating on really dressing up those potatoes. Our world today is really concentrating on, you know, make sure you don't smoke. It's a big deal. Make sure you don't eat, you know, too many fatty foods. Big deal. Make sure you jog every day. Watch your cholesterol. Meanwhile, 
we don't ever talk about fornication. Young people today are just sleeping around. It's just natural today during our high school years for everyone to have partners, to have multiple partners. Parents won't say anything about them. Oh, it's just this, it's just a different world today. We're growing up, you know, just different world. It's it is a different world. It's a wickeder world, which means Christians should stand even firmer. Pulpits should preach even louder, but they don't. They're weaker. Fornication, adultery. Well, the, the, the younger generation has a prime example of, of uh, sexual morality because they're looking right at the adulterating parents, the adulterating older people we have in our world today. You want to talk about, look at our world today on the news. Every day you're finding some pervert who came out who's been, um, you know, making sexual advances at a woman in the workplace. Well, is it any wonder with how terrible our culture is today? Is it any wonder when, when, when you can get on, on websites and look at pornography anytime and people don't even bat an eye at it anymore? Oh, yeah, he's doing porn. We have magazines that people look at. Where's magazines are now um, old news, but for a while they're just accepted magazine. Yeah, I, I read this. I read this magazine. It's just a pornographic magazine. And we accept it as a culture. We accept fornication. We accept adultery. We accept it talks about here. It says, from within out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. So we are so worried about people smoking cigarettes. we got to get smoking down. Smoking kills. Smoking kills. And it's probably not too good for you. Maybe, maybe it's not. And, you know, obesity is probably not that great for you. But do you want to talk about murders? Abortion. Amen. We're murdering babies left and right and left and right. It's legal in this country to murder a baby. That's where we've omitted the weightier issue. The weightier issue being a child's life is being destroyed for the sake of woman's body Woman has a right to do whatever she wants with her body. Well, my friend, what about the child's rights? What about the baby's rights? Flat-out murder. There's no other way around it. Our culture today has just somehow got to the point where we've accepted it. We, we, we say that, ah, oh, you know, it's a smaller thing. It's a smaller uh, body, so it can't feel pain or it doesn't have any kind of rights. Flat-out murder. We're like a heathen country. We're like South America and whatever, whatever year in the past when they used to do child sacrifices. It's terrible. And there's no other way for me to say it. And you can say, you know, there's a lot of people believe abortion's wrong. Yeah, a lot of people do believe abortion's wrong from different churches. And they're absolutely right. Abortion is wrong. But why does it still happen? Why are we so worried about these other things? You have uh, Michelle Obama... And I'm not going to get into, get into uh, politics here. Michelle Obama, their big push during the Obama years was to talk about you know, childhood obesity. Let's get the lunch menu better in the schools. Meanwhile, we're, we're ripping kids' arms and legs out. Well, how far gone is our country? How far gone is our country? When we're, try, we're so worried about these little works, well, you see what we're getting at here. When you're worried about potatoes, that's all it's ever going to be. You're going, to be, you're going to grow the nicest potatoes in this world if that's all you're ever focused on. Until you focus on God and His sacrifice, Christ coming to die for your sins, until you make that your focus in life, you're going to be focused on small things that are pointless and passing. Turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you would, talking about this, talking about what we focus on, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm preaching against the philosophy of Cain today because it's very alive. It's alive and well in our world today. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And here we go again. I'm going to make some more friends talking about other churches. But 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, in the latter times... People are going to depart from the faith. We've seen that. People don't go to church. People don't go to good churches. Absolutely. But they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, what are these doctrines of devils? Here's, it, it points out some telltale signs of such doctrines. Two, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Three, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So here are a couple telltale signs of a doctrine of a devil. Do any of these ring a bell? Forbidding to marry. I don't know, but I haven't seen too many nuns with spouses, have you? I haven't seen too many priests with spouses, have you? I would take that to mean that uh, Catholic Church sure sounds like a doctrine of the devil. I don't know how you get around it. And commanded to abstain from meats. Uh, yeah, we got to avoid some meats there too. Let's have uh, Fish Friday or whatever it is. Seventh-day Venice also say you need to avoid meats. 
If that's called a doctrine of the devil, I would steer clear of it. I would eat meat. I would not forbid people to marry. That's our world today. Here I am preaching against it because in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, it preaches against it. The Bible does. You can stand that God's word or not. A big a light bulb will go off in your head. A light bulb will go off in your head when you understand doctrines of devils. When you understand that there are doctrines out there that are straight from the pit of hell. Yes. The devil feeding people doctrine. So a light bulb needs to go off in your head. I have relatives, I have friends who are Catholic or some other faith who I love. And that's fine. You should love them. Love them, pray for them. But you should understand you love them, but they're going to a church that is disseminating, sending out <laughs> the devil's bidding. Yes. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. That's why we preach about it. We don't hate Catholic people. We don't hate other faiths. But if you are sending out Cain's message, Cain's philosophy of works, the devil's message, then we need to preach against it. We need to warn people of it. Listen to this. We'll keep reading on. It touches on a lot of things here, more than just uh, Catholics or Seventh-day Adventists. It says, verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. I want to be a good minister. I want to share the gospel with people. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Let's just refuse man-made notions, man-made priorities. Let's look at what the Bible has to say. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable unto all things. The world today needs to understand that. It is absolutely the truth. The world today, more than any other time in history, is body conscious, physique conscious, health conscious. We are so worried about what this physical flesh, this physical outside of us, the shell that's on the outside of us, we're so worried about it that we omit the weightier things, we forget about godliness. Godliness is profitable unto all things. So today, if we took a poll, how many people hit the gym this morning? How many, I mean, in the world, in the valley, country, wherever you want to say, how many people hit the gym this morning? Probably a good portion of us, didn't we? How many people woke up worried today about their belly fat? Probably, probably a good portion of us. Worried about their cholesterol? Probably a good portion of us. Flip side, how many people woke up today and said, I am worried about finding a good church. I need to get a good church and go to it. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. You call yourself a Christian, you say you believe the Bible. You say you have Christ as your Savior. You need to be in a church, my friend. You need to be seeking a church. You haven't found the right one yet? Well, do a diligent search. The Bible says, Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Go church find, uh, hunting. Find the right church. Get in one. And then forsake not the assembling yourselves together. You will not find a Christian in the New Testament who did not attend church. But today we have thousands, millions of people. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but, uh, you know... This, I talked about that in the past. This organized religion, you know, I don't like it. You know, a lot of hypocrites in the church. A lot of a lot of bad Christians out there. Yeah, okay. So you're never going to go to church. You're never going to put your back to the work. You're never going to stand and support a, a God-fearing, Bible-believing church, which is where all the work of God is done. The Bible says in First Timothy chapter three, fifteen, right here across the page, it says, uh, "But if, if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth." Absolutely talking about the local church. So you, if you are not in a church, attending a church, supporting a church, you are not supporting the truth. Because that from the local church is where the pillar and ground of the truth is. That's where the truth abounds from. That's where the truth um, uh, is really sent out from, is from the local church. You've done nothing to support that. I have no respect for those who have not put their back to the work. No respect. I, I may be able to respect your potatoes. Oh, you are a great... Uh, great farmer, or oh, you were a great teacher, oh, well, you're a great businessman, good for you, but in godly things and spiritual things and things that will last, I have no respect for you. You've not put your back to God's work. But here we are, bodily exercise, profit of little. Everyone's worried about their belly fat, no one's worried about God, no one's worried about sharing the Savior with others. 
9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all accept, acceptation. 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is a Savior of all men, especially of those but that believe. This is why Logan Fowler, this is why Truth Baptist Church is worried more about souls than about belly fat, worried more about souls than about potatoes, is because we serve a living God. Not the God that you think. Not the God that you have created in your mind. That God that just sits there. That God that's dead. That God has no hand in your life today. I serve a living God. A risen Savior. Who is a Savior of all men. Especially those that believe. I want to tell you about that Savior. I want you to believe on that Savior. Those are my priorities. Those are the priorities of a true Christian. Yes. What are your priorities, my friend? My friend who does not show up to church. Ever. You'll show up on a Christmas service. You'll show up at Easter service. But the other 363 days of the year... Um, your life is your own. Your priorities are your own. You're living a life of potatoes. These things command and teach, verse 11 says. That's why I teach it. God tells me to. 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Till, I can't, till, till Christ comes back, that's what our life is supposed to be filled with. Give attendance to reading. Have you picked up your Bible in the past week? In the past month? In the past year? Pick up your Bibles. To exhortation. Are you worried about your brother? You can be, you find you can go on your own path and you can end up in hell yourself. That, that's okay. That's your choice, your decision. But are you exhorting those around you, your children, who need a Savior? Are you worried about them? Or are you just so selfish? Uh, you know, I'm just going to believe what I want. No one's going to tell me what I'm going to believe. I'm not, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay, well, if you're wrong, you also just damned your children to hell because you never took them to a God-fearing church. You never handed the Bible and said, Hey, you should at least give this Bible a shot, kid. Read it. See it, see it, you know, find it, see if the truth is in there. You check it out. You haven't. You've, you've hid it because you want your children to be just as twice dead as you. You want your children to be just as simple as you are. You want your children to be just as lost as you are. Just as confused, just as short-sighted as you are. Very very mature. Way to go, parents. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the prophecy, the land on the hands of the presbytery. Fifteen, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy prophecy may appear to all. Give yourself wholly to God and his word, God and his will. Sixteen, take heed unto thyself and to thy, into do, the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. To doctrine, to doctrine, to doctrine. Doctrine is a foreign word today. The world doesn't use it. Churches don't use it. The Bible says we're to have sound doctrine. Well, what's your doctrine? Do you know, I mean, what do you believe? Believe in heaven, hell, how are you saved? Do you believe in rights and wrongs of all sorts? Do you believe that we're supposed to contend for the faith? What do you believe about Christ? Who was Christ? You don't. Do you even know where the book of Genesis is? We're reading that today. You know where the book of Matthew is? The world today is lost. I'm not doing it to brag on myself. I'm doing it to convict you that we are. your life is filled with, with potatoes, while meanwhile the sacrifice, everything we need is right here. Pick it up. It's not a hard concept. Well, you would turn back to Genesis chapter 4 again. Priorities. Are your priorities on potatoes today? So, verse 5, again, it says, But Cain, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So Cain is not just sad, though. That, that word wroth is mad. So today we're not just sad at our state in life. We're not just sad when we live our whole lives for ourselves, and then we end up with nothing to show for it. We've been having fun this whole time and just pursuing pleasure our whole lives. And now we're seven years old and, oh man, now I got diabetes. My wife died. My kids don't even like me anymore. I don't see them anymore. Or whatever it, whatever it is. We're not just sad at that point. We're mad at God. We're mad at God. We're mad that our way did not work. We picked our way. We worked hard at it. Why aren't things working out better? That's the state of the world today. We preached that last week. Mankind is mad, not just a remorseful. We have no place for repentance. Six, and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? This is God Almighty saying, Why are you mad? 
7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. God is saying, look it, you messed up. You thought that your works were good enough. I told you no. What the offering I wanted, what I wanted you to bring was a sacrifice like your brother Abel did. That's what I wanted. But why are you mad? I'm telling you the answer right now. I'm telling you, I'm flat out saying that that's what I wanted. It's, it's clear, clear as day. Why are you mad? Because he doesn't want to obey God. He wants to re reject God. That's the world today. We would present people with the gospel. We say, hey, the gospel, no, it's, I'm sorry, it's not in the Catholic Church. They don't preach the right gospel. It's not in your Jehovah Witness Church. It's not in the charismatic movement. It's not in the Church of Christ, thinking you're baptized for salvation. It's not in any of those things. The gospel's right here. The gospel's right here. That's the straight stuff, what Christ taught. Christ and Christ alone. People get mad at that. Why? You can, you can change your mind right now. You don't want to change your mind. You want to believe what you want to believe, and you would rather believe something that says you need to do something, you need cr to create something, you need to produce something with these two hands, you need to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you need to achieve and to excel, and that's how you're going to get where you want to go. Pleases your flesh, does not please God. But right now I'm telling you today, Here's the truth, the gospel. We're going to look at exactly what the sacrifice for sin is. You have a choice today to choose to accept the gospel or just to be mad and say, no, nah, I'm not going to accept that gospel. I'm, gonna, I'm, still, I'm still going to do it my way. Thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Mankind today has a three-year-old philosophy. Uh, my son Isaac, so, okay, so for instance, my son Isaac, he, um, if he, he does something bad to his sister, I tell Isaac, you need to go say you're sorry to your sister or you're going to get spanked. I give an ultimatum, right? Do this, Isaac, or you're going to get spanked. And by the way, spanking in a moderate, controlled way is how we're supposed to raise our kids. That's when you love your kids. We give them a little smack on the bottom. You say, hey, do what's right. Obey dad. Obey mom. That's not child abuse. Child abuse is neglecting to discipline your children. That's child abuse. And I always laugh. The people who are the most worried about child abuse, by the way, are the same people who say, yeah, let's rip, rip that baby's arms and legs out of the socket, pull that baby out of there, and give the mother her body back. Yeah, it, it's, it's counterintuitive, not logical. But Isaac, so I say, Isaac, go apologize to your sister for hitting her, or you're going to get spanked. You're going to swat it on the bottom. And Isaac, lots of times, he'll just start crying. Ah! <laughs> And I'll say, what are you crying for? I haven't even spanked you yet. I'll say, what's going on? I'll say, all you got to do is go apologize to your sister and everything will be fine. Just obey me and you'll be fine. The world is the same way. God extends his hand again and again and again, extending it here. Here's the solution. Here's the solution. I mean, punishment is going to come. There's hellfire to pay if you don't accept the Savior. But here's the Savior. Accept the Savior. God extends his hand. God is so merciful. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Would you talk about God's mercy? This loving God we serve, who has more mercy in his heart, more long suffering than I ever could have, especially for people who reject him time and time again, who blaspheme his name, who spit upon him, who killed his son. Matthew chapter 23. Look at this with me, if you would. Matthew chapter 23 and verse. Oh, by the way, while we're here, look at 23.9. says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Last I checked, the Catholics still call uh, their priest father. Uh, just read that verse. It doesn't sound quite right to me. Another one of those things where you read your Bible, you'll find something's wrong with the church you're going to. But look down at verse 33, would you? So this is Christ again. This is Christ describing the Pharisees after another argument here with the Pharisees. Verse 33 says, Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Strong words from Christ, from God Almighty here. Uh, people like to paint Christ as some little mild-mannered, mild-spoken guy. Here he says, You're a bunch of snakes, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. God sends peep person after person. Prophets, teachers, these people, wise men, who are telling the truth. We hate them. We kill them. 
The world despises those who are good, despises those who are anything Christ-like. 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. I'm talking about here, all the people they rejected. You know, the start of rejecting the gospel began... I mean, the world's rejection of the gospel. Again, right back here at Cain and Abel. The gospel's there, and we're going to see that Cain kills Abel. Everybody knows the story. We're, we're, we're uh, doing a little spoiler here, but Cain kills Abel. We have to know absolutely that's where it started. And after that, they started killing prophets, wise men, anyone who's teaching God's word after that, they kept killing them. They get to the New Testament, they kill John the Baptist, cut his head off, the great preacher, greatest man born among men. They kill him, they kill Christ, and the day they despise Christians. Anyone who keeps telling the same story that we're supposed to be telling. Christ and Christ alone. Our works in this world are worthless. The world doesn't like that message. We're going to preach it anyways. But here's God's hand, regardless of how they reject the Savior. 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Ye would not. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You're standing there, you're sitting there in your life. You've been told the truth again and again and again. You're hearing the truth again this morning. So again, God's extending his hand to you, saying, I want to bring you in, I want to save you. And you would not. Hopefully that's not you. Hopefully, eventually you wake up in this life and accept Christ as your personal Savior before it's too late. Look back here real quickly, Genesis chapter 4. Then we're, we're winding down our sermon. Genesis 4, the end of the story, is just watch how man's how man reacts. This is the pattern in life. We live for ourselves. We're presented with the truth. We don't want the truth. We're sad with our situation, but we don't want to do God's will anyways. We don't want to obey. We don't want to submit ourselves, humble ourselves before God. So we reject God, and then we get mad about it. And verse 8 says, oh, by the way, I should point out in verse 7, it says, If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. It's all about sin. This whole thing God was teaching here is about sin. If you don't accept the sin covering, then your sin is right there, open and honest, like a big old open wound. Your whole life, you're walking around with sin there. You take Christ, your Savior, there's a sin covering, just as they covered Adam and Eve. That's the gospel. Learn it again and again and again throughout the Bible. But the sin's just sitting there if you don't take Christ, your Savior. Verse 8 says, And, again, and Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel's brother and slew him. So there's the very there's the mature crowd. There's the, the Cain crowd, the very the gardening crowd. Very mature. They love the world, they love their works, and they kill people because they get so angry about it. Nine, and the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he says, I know not. So you become an absolute liar. To reject the gospel and to Act like you live peaceably with it and act like you're just fine. Oh, I'm at peace. I'm having a great time, a great life. You're an absolute liar. You say nothing's wrong. Oh, I'm not scared of death. The Bible says you're scared of death. No, I'm not scared of death. I'll be fine. I'll go to hell. You know, when I die, there's hell. I'll have a party. You're absolutely scared in your boots. And that's not the only thing you lie about. You make all kinds of excuses in your mind not to, not to believe the gospel. So you're an unbeliever. You're also a liar. And then, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? You're angry, make excuses, you, you, you rebuke, you mock Christians. 10, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. That's the life of the unbeliever. A vagabond, a fugitive, someone without a home, without a purpose, with no clue of where they're going. And look at Cain's response. This is, a, this is the response here today. Verse 13 says, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. He, he calls for justice here. How could a loving God ever send people to hell? How could a loving God be so cruel to me? You just murdered someone. But you're, you're calling this appeal to God. God, she should be more just. He should be more loving. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Oh, there shouldn't be a real hell. How, how can that ever be? There's a real hell because sin has to go somewhere. 
And there's a real Savior. It's all real. It's a choice for you to believe or to leave. Cain chose not to believe it. His life was as a vagabond there, as a fugitive. No purpose, no point. Live, you live your little span of life here, drop in the grave, and go to hell. And meanwhile, all your friends, your relatives, your kids, leave them to fend for themselves. Pick the same path you picked. Very mature, very far-sighted. You keep going. You keep playing your fantasy football. Uh, you just keep going, working your 8-to-5 your job, working for the weekend. You keep doing that. Never look for your Savior. In closing, look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. 11, one. This, this ties everything together what we've been talking about today. 11.1 Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is faith. This is what God wants. The Bible says, without faith it's impossible to please God. God wants you to believe in something you cannot see. You can see your own potatoes. You can see your own toiling in the garden. You cannot see Christ. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Evolution is an absolute lie. The world was made from nothing. It came out of nothing. God spoke in it. He spoke it, he spoke it into existence. That's what we believe through faith. Verse 4, we have the same faith that Abel has. Verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Abel said, I'm going to trust God. I know I didn't work for this. I'm going to take this one animal. I'm going to put it here. I'm going to present it to God as a sacrifice. Out of faith, not knowing what it was, God accepted Abel's sacrifice. The same way we're supposed to accept, he will accept Christ as our sacrifice today. To break this down even further, look over here, at, look back in, in Hebrews chapter 10. Talking about faith. All about faith. You're saved by faith and faith alone. And every year and every dispensation in the world, you're saved by faith and faith alone. Hebrews chapter 10 proves it. Hebrews 10 and verse... Uh, look at uh, 4. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Uh, Abel, just so everyone's not confused, Abel was not saved by that actual... by, 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 the, by the sheep that he put there. And presented. He was not saved by the blood of that sheep. By doing that, he showed that he believed in the Savior to come, and the Lamb without spot, the true, the perfect Lamb that take away the sins of the world. He believed in that Lamb. By doing that, he said, I believe in that. That saved him. Because you're not saved by the blood of bulls and goats. You're not for saving any work of any kind. Five, wherefore, when he cometh in the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You're not saved. So just so you understand the story, you're not saved. They were never saved in the Old Testament by their offering, by their offering of sheep. Never. All that went to show, though, they believed in something to come, something they could, they did not see, a Savior. They look forward to the Savior coming. Today, we're in the same boat they are, except for we're just looking back. We believe that Savior came. We believe Jesus Christ died once for all. 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So as mankind does, mankind takes a good thing and they ruin it. So after the time of Abel, some people got in this whole idea of the, okay, so now just these sacrifices, that's what's actually saving us. And then they, even the time they get to Christ, and they still believe in something like that. That this physical work is saving you. Absolutely wrong. Cain and Abel, so Cain and Abel teach us one thing. We're not saved by our works. Understand it. The just shall live by faith. And every priest, I'm sorry, verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. The gospel is simple. 
faith in Christ and Christ alone as a sacrifice for our sins. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? If you don't, verse 13 is, is a nice little mention there. 13 says, From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. If you don't accept Christ, you are rejecting Christ. You're an enemy of the cross of Christ. You're on the wrong side of history. You're the enemy of God Almighty. I would not be there if I were you, because one day you'll stand before him. You can hate me. You can hate churches like me. You can hate Bible believers. You can hate those who say they're God-fearing. Hate whoever you want, but it doesn't matter. You're not hating me. You're hating God. You're kicking against the pricks of Almighty God. One day you will stand before God, and there'll be no more excuses. All the animosity you have in your heart and soul, all the excuses you've created of that Christian did me wrong one time, that Christian is not quite perfect, all the excuses you have will be worth zero. 17. Of their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Look down, if you would, at uh, verse... Let's go all the way to verse 29. This is talking about those who reject the Savior, who reject the perfect um, sacrifice for their sins. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite the Spirit of grace. This specifically is talking about how the children of Israel had God right there. God separated them as a people. He sanctified them. Sometimes that word just means separated. God separated them out and said, Here, I'm going to teach you all the lessons. I'm going to show you these sacrifices and how they point to the coming Savior. They had all those lessons taught to them, and still they rejected the Savior. The same thing is what you do today. When you hear a sermon like today, we're presenting the gospel to you. We read a track of the gospel presented to you. You're time and time again, a Christian is witnessing to you, saying, believe this story, believe this truth about Almighty God, and you reject it. The Bible says, how much sore punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. 30 says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Fear God. Fear God. It will open your eyes. It will motivate you to believe. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Mix fear and faith together, and you're getting on the right track to accept the gospel. 